Wednesday, people. This is Voice of San Diego at home. It is Voice of San Diego at home with Scott Lewis. I'm the CEO, editor in chief at Voice of San Diego. We have a special edition of Out Show at Home today. Uh, we've got UC San Diego's Kim Prather. She's going to come on and talk about. She's the distinguished chair of atmospheric chemistry and distinguished pre professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UC San Diego. She's got a lot of titles. She's got a lot of things going on. She's uh, globe trotting from her from her own Zoom office as she makes the case for a lot of changes in how we understand the virus and talk about the virus. She's going to come on. She's been a regular, and uh, apparently we still have to we still have to focus on this virus. It's not letting let us be. It's still uh, it's still the the topic du jour. And obviously in California and in San Diego, we need to talk a lot about it. Uh, there's a lot to learn since the last time we had. Uh, Kim Prather on. We're also going to bring on when he gets here, uh, Dr. Robert Schooley. He's the uh, chief of division of infectious diseases at UC San Diego Health. Uh, Chip Schooley, as, his, uh, as he goes by, he's going to come in and talk to us uh, about the disease as well when we get the chance. But for uh, without further ado, let's bring on uh, Dr. Kimberly Prather. Hey, Kim. Oh, sorry. Oops. There we go. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Hanging in there, hanging in there, staying busy, I guess. Yeah, a little bit. Let's get into <laughs> that. You've been going around. You 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 uh you had had some words for Governor Cuomo the other day. You've uh <laughs> you've been talking to your buddy uh uh, uh Dr. Fauci, uh as you call him, uh Tony. <laughs> Tony Fauci. We, you, what is exactly you are doing uh, and trying to get people to understand around the globe uh, about uh, your work and what you've discovered and understood about the virus? Yeah, so um, I have been, you know, as you know, we've been talking for months about yeah. this, right? So my expertise, my background is aerosols, these little, but not the stuff that comes out of a spray can, the stuff that comes out of your mouth when you speak. And um, the way that, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were told that it was on surfaces and clean surfaces. And, um, you know, we're just like, it, it's in the air, you know, you're inhaling it. And so the way to protect people is to get, you know, how you protect yourself and to get people to recognize that this is airborne. And so it's been a, a, a long saga of pushing, yes, pushing Tony Fauci, pushing CDC, pushing WHO, um, you know, just trying to get people to realize that, you know, this is, you know, once you acknowledge it's in the air, I keep telling people it's a very fixable problem. You know, you filter the air, you know, it's simple. You we wear a mask. Like I, I, I'm a believer that if people understand that it's that simple and it is that, then they have a reason to want to listen to all these things that people are telling them to do. That's, that's what I hope. And so, yeah, it's been a long saga, but we finally, just this week, CDC has finally, finally, finally um, got much clearer guidance. It's not completely perfect, but all this is so important for school reopenings to be safe, to reopen our town and be able to live life like, like, and to do it and keep it that way. So I've been on a pretty strong um, mission with a lot of other people who study the air like I do to get to help the public understand. So let's get into so what does it actually specifically mean if you're successful? Are we talking about um, guidance like what the CDC comes out with sort of de-emphasizing cleaning surfaces and washing hands and emphasizing instead uh, ventilation uh, outdoors, that sort of thing? Is that the practical effects of the work you're doing right now? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, you know, this virus, um, again, it just, it's not, it's not being spread. One of the things we realized early on, you know, normally you think about people coughing and sneezing 
and spraying this big stuff that will fall to the ground. This is coming out just from people speaking. And this virus has found a sneaky way to get around in that the people who are sick don't know they're sick. And so they're just walking around, going to parties, going to bars, talking and releasing millions of viruses that do not fall to the ground. They actually, you have to think about them as like cigarette smoke. They get released into the air. And if you're indoors with that person, indoors is the place we have to be the most careful. If you're indoors with somebody who has it, it's this thing about being indoors with the smoker for an hour. You know, that room will just fill up. And so, yeah, so ventilation is important. Filtration is important. Masks are important. You know, these are the things, you know, instead of focusing on the surfaces, we call that, you know, cir circus hygiene, surface hygiene. You know, it was just like not, it was just kind of made it, you feel good, but it's not, you're not getting it that as much from touching surfaces and then touching your face. You're getting it because it's just floating around in the air. Yeah, so... I wrote a piece uh, featuring you and, and several of your colleagues in Voice of San Diego about uh, about that, what you had discovered, what you understood, what that might mean for particularly open opening schools. If you go to my Twitter feed, uh, it's the pin tweet uh, is that story. And I'm still super proud of that for what you helped me understand uh, about that. But some of the feedback I got was interesting. Uh, the, the the cigarette analogy was really powerful, right? Yeah. It helped people understand the same way it travels. That if, if I'm smoking a cigarette in the corner of the room, you can tell like what's going to happen to that. Sometimes you can smell the cigarette smoke, you know, the moment somebody lights up. And that right. was part of what they, what they brought up though, is like, obviously like that's any kind of ventilation doesn't keep you from smelling the smoke. And what I had to tell them was like, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot more smoke than there is like actual virus from your breath. Is, right. is that a fair way to, to say it? Yeah, it's fair. Um, you know, I really, I mean, I've had the same kind of questions. People start going into the details. What yeah, we yeah. meant to, when we started was just that everybody, well, not everybody, if you're my age, whatever, you know, you've been in a room with a smoker and you've watched the smoke waft through the air. So it's more the visualization of the fact that it goes a lot further than six feet. Everybody knows that. And you can just see a room just fill up. And so that was what we meant was more visually, although you can smell it. But remember that, you know, the chance of getting infected, it's not just getting one whiff, probably. We don't, we don't think it is. Um, you'd rather not. But if you do smell a little bit for a short time and walk away, that's a good thing. Um, if you hang out and with a person who's smoking and you continue to inhale it, even at kind of a low smell, that's not good. It's just you're continuously inhaling the virus. And after you inhale enough, the chances of getting infected just, just go right up. Yeah. So, so um, and that so, was a good article. That was a good art. That was a great article, by the way. Oh, thank you. That means a yeah. lot. Yeah. That was um, really good. Well, so I think then uh, the, the follow-up, we, we applied that to, to schools, but I saw the other day a, a video on TV, a, a commercial from the state of California saying, you know, it was a bunch of firefighters like saying, wash your hands, stay six feet away. And it seems like if you were in charge of California's messaging, what you'd say is don't go inside with other people. If you are inside with other people, make sure it's as ventilated as it possibly can be and that the air is being cleaned as, as well as it can be. And that's what everybody should be focusing on. It should be it should be the air almost wholly. And the six feet rule, if I'm right, was was derived from the ballistic droplets that come out your mouth and then that's go right. down. That's and that right. they can go six feet in the air and down. That's how they came up with that, right? Yeah. And so your whole right. point is like, yeah, those ballistic droplets are are not great. You don't want to be inhaling them, but it doesn't really matter if they're gonna be spreading if they're smaller ones that are gonna circulate like cigarette smoke. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you just have to be like almost all the outbreaks. We don't get the data. I know you tried. Thanks for trying on where it happens. But I'll tell you, it's just happening in indoors. Like there's rarely a case from outdoors. That's why the playground thing was a little crazy. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you can't catch it outdoors. If you were like downwind of somebody for an hour and they were talking to you and the wind was blowing in your face, you know, maybe. But the outbreaks where we get 20 people, 30 people, you know, 40 people out of 50 get get sick, right? You're seeing this over and over and over. That is, that is in the air. There's no way all the people at a wedding all touch the same dirty surface, right? But you all share the air. 
That's what we keep saying. You share the air. And so if you are in a room with someone that you don't know, if that's an office, you know, like I've heard people say, oh, someone in my office got sick and I was with them for eight hours, but our desks were six feet apart. So I'm not, I'm not supposed to go get tested. Like that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. If you're in the same room with somebody, you are breathing the same air. And if that person is infected and doesn't know it, there's a high likelihood that you're going to get sick as well. So wear a mask. Don't, you know, we, I finally got, I think we got CDC to drop the, if you can't stay six feet apart, we got them to drop it on the indoor part. Wear mm -hmm. a mask when you're indoors with anyone who's outside of your bubble, you know, the people that you live with. And they're even starting to make noise that, you know, the spread also happens in households. And so if you have someone in your house that you think is exposed or a little bit of a risky job and you've got someone, you know, you're worried, then that person probably, you know, should be wearing a mask or at the very least, you should have like a HEPA filter going because that'll just filter out the particles um, if they are exhaling them. The other thing I have is I have this little, this is what all the schools have now because I, you know, this our San Diego Unified does. Um, this is CO2. And so this just tells you, like, you don't have to guess, you know, it tells you what the levels of CO2 are. We all, when we breathe, we exhale CO2, right? And so if you're in a room that's poorly ventilated, by definition, houses, right, we seal them up to stay warm. So they're not ventilated well. And so basically, if you, you know, I take this to the grocery store. I take this, I took this the other night to Costco. I mean, I take it to see how ventilated. And if, the, if I go in a place that's not well ventilated, then I turn around and walk back out. So, the, you know, just knowing what the levels are, you know, that the air is not being turned over. So you don't have to guess. So they will have these in the, they have these in the school. Um, the CO2 sensors, they also have particle sensors in the schools. Um, and they also are going to put, um, they upgraded all the filtration in the rooms that they can. And then they bought, I forget, some ridiculous number, like 10,000 air purifiers for yeah. the rooms that don't. So they've got, they know how to clean, you know, the air. So if we can get the community spread down, everybody's asking when the schools, I know that's, you're passionate about get back to school. We can, we are ready. We're more ready probably than any school district in the country, but we can't, it's too risky when the numbers are this high in the community. So if we can just all hang in there and think positively as best we can, because we're all sick of this, but if we could just knock it back, like we were doing, and then get the schools going again. You know, schools have to, I'm sorry, but schools have to come before bars, yeah. you know? And so, you know, things like that, like just making wise choices. Um, as you know, I've been trying to sort of coach the, the county. Um, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm coaching places all over the world right now. And so I'm trying to help San Diego as well. So yeah. I mean, we have a pretty good team. Well, let's get into, uh, I want to talk to some of the folks out there. A lot of questions. We invited them. We can bring some of those on. Yep. Um, there is one here I actually wanted to deal with because it deals with aerosols. We talked about it a lot uh, and I dealt with it in my article. Uh, and it's, it's kind of this misconception that comes up about masks. It's a common one. If you spray perfume when you have a mask on, you can still smell the perfume. Mm -hmm. Therefore, masks are useless. I, I love this because it's just like where if you wear a coat outside, often you still feel cold, right? There's still cold right. air that comes in. doesn't mean you want to take off the coat. Yeah, like that's you exactly still right. want the coat on. Uh, exactly and right. the same principle here. Like the mask, yeah, you still breathe. There's obviously still things coming in through the mask because you still need to breathe. Yeah. But, but you're, you're filtering it out as best you can. That's the whole point there. But perfume is not a good proxy because perfume is a, is a gas. So those are teeny tiny little molecules that can get through the mask. Where it's the, yeah, like air. The yeah. Smoke, you can't, it doesn't get through. It's big. These, these virus particles are big. And so most of them get trapped, even in simple, you know, multi-layer. We always say you have two layers, three layers of different materials. That's better. Um, but even a quote, bad mask people, the data are really coming out now. They're like 75, 80%. As you say, you know, if let's just make a simple analogy, two people, everybody's wearing masks. Two people are wearing 50%, which would be an awful mask. Like they're not that bad, but let's just say we had horrible masks. You know, if you do that and you look at the fraction that then you inhale, you get a 75% reduction if both people are wearing 50%. So, you know, that just knocks the lower you, the lower amount you inhale, the two, what two things, the lower amount you inhale, the less chance you're going to get sick. And if you do get sick because you got hit with a smaller amount, 
There's some people that think that you get a much less severe um, yeah. sickness, right? And when Dr. Cooley comes on, we'll talk yeah. about that because that's his big yeah. point too, right? Yeah, that's, like the, that's exactly right. You, if you lo lower the number of uh, virus particles you, you start to take in, you're going to have a, a less severe uh, form exactly of the disease. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's take another one of these. So if you have a CO2 uh, meter that you're watching, are you yeah. looking at the actual levels or are you just this looking at high. the fluctuation? So outdoors, right? Because the CO, this is high right now. I'm breathing a lot of hot air right now talking to right. you. <laughs> 900, I would be, if there was somebody else in the room with me right now, I'd be out of here. <laughs> I'd be right. opening a window. I'd be opening a window. That's the cheapest thing to do. But anyway, and we can do that. We're in San Diego, but 900 right now. So there's a number that we shoot for at 600. Outdoors, it's 420. Is just CO2 coming from all of our fossil fuel burning, right? So 420 right. is as low as you can go. So we try to say 600. If it gets to 800, you can probably, you're okay, you know? But if it starts hitting 1,000, you go in a car with somebody and they are recirculating the air, this thing will peg over 2,000 and that's not good. So, um, yeah, this thing even has stoplights. I don't know if you can see. It has red, green, and yellow lights. And it tells you um, whether you should be vacating the room or opening a window. Um, yeah, and, so, yes, yeah, less, than, less than 600, ideally. Sorry, and, that's a long answer. You no, know, no, you guys were using that as a proxy for San Diego Unified School District classrooms mm -hmm. to measure their ventilation. So you're not measuring yeah. the virus with that, but you yeah. are measuring a proxy about whether – the ventilation is occurring. So if a teacher has one of those in their classroom, it starts to go up to 900 to 1,000, mm -hmm. then get a window open, get a fan mm -hmm. going, mm -hmm. and you can start to, that's the proactive way. Again, yeah. picture yeah. one of your little kids smoking a cigarette. What would you do to clear the room? That's yeah. the same principle. Now, little kids shouldn't smoke cigarettes. Right. Right? Right. <laughs> but <laughs> same idea. <laughs> same idea. They, they, it behaves the exact, exactly the same. So it's just, I think it, I call it, you know, and I think San Diego Unified agrees that it's just an anxiety, you know, like you can't see it. They're invisible. So you're, what are you going to do? Be inside all the time, freaking out that your air is stale, you know, I mean, that would be horrible. And so they've tried to make it. The other thing San Diego Unified is going to do is that every, the kids all have to wear masks. And so if everyone, you know, again, I don't care if their desks are three to six feet apart, they wear a mask. And so the tricky part is food. Everybody keeps asking, well, what about when they eat? That's hard. Throw them outside, ideally. Again, we're in San Diego. And so, you know, the, the riskiest time is indoors when you can't wear a mask, which is eating and drinking. And yeah. so it just, it's that simple. You just avoid, avoid it. Also, you don't talk. If people don't talk, you don't, you produce like, hard you hardly produce you, know, you produce far less i'll just say um so that's how in tokyo they have tr super packed trains but they all wear masks and they're all quiet and they've never had one case so if you're quiet and you're indoors you know there's all these tricks you can play and it sounds crazy but we do understand it and we are we're on the home stretch and so we just gotta if you do these things will starve this virus. You know, we're the food, essentially. So we're smarter than the virus, I swear. And so we just have to, we just have to do these little simple, you know, things for a little longer and um, we can kill it. Well, so let's look at uh, something together, if you don't mind. So this is um, the chart of hospitalization oh, yeah. that was updated today. Yeah. So, so hospitalizations, I watched it all summer. Summer, it, it's it peaked at about 550 or so uh, in July, and then it went back down to like 200. Started to get a little bit up to 300 in the in the November time frame, and then we just saw over the last what three weeks or so just this spike. I, I don't know how how you can describe it any other way. Today, 915 people are in the hospital, uh, struggling with the with the virus. Uh, 228 of them are in ICU beds, you know, the most intensive care we can provide. Yep. And so uh, one of the things I said last week that kind of got your attention, you wanted me to deal with is like, well, I don't, I don't feel like three weeks ago we did anything different. Um, but three weeks ago, there was this incredible surge happening in the Midwest. And you could watch the map literally spreading through Utah, through uh, Arizona, 
and it hit it hit us. So, what's your understanding as a scientist when you look at data like that? We didn't really change our behavior, although you did wor warn months ago about you know some of the openings we were you know allowing some of the indoor right. dining stuff we like did. that. Yeah. Um, but there was that sort of two months after that, and yeah. you you explained it to me well. You basically said like, well. There wasn't a high concentration of the virus here. There's nothing here. It wasn't here. You can't catch it. You can get away with bad behavior. <laughs> you can get away if it's not there to breathe it, right? So I think you're right. What happened is people, you know, we used to be more careful probably, and it slipped a little. You just keep slipping, and you're like, I didn't get sick. I went to the store, and I was there. You know, you start changing just little things, and you get away with it is what I say. Mm -hmm. And so then when it appears, when it's actually there, then the exact same thing you did three weeks ago doesn't work anymore. You will inhale it, but you can't get sick if it's not there. You don't have to, you, probably that other time we didn't even have to be wearing, I hate to say it, maybe we didn't have to wear our masks, but you know, because it wasn't there, you're not going to get sick, but if it's there and it is there. And so I think one of the other things I was talking to somebody about, you know, places like Australia, I don't know if you saw, they just crushed it. It's gone. Yeah. They closed travel because the, how did it get here? It got here because people were traveling out and coming in and bringing yeah. it back and so once it's in your community and it starts to take off that's when it just goes that's wild you know at ucsd ucsd right we've i don't know if you've noticed we've created a bubble we have the safest look it, like you want to live on the ucsd campus right now let me tell you it's Pretty like nice. less than one percent is you know the and it's been hovering around 0.1 percent while the community is exploding but again, we follow all the rules. We don't have people jumping back and forth off and on. Once it starts being brought into wherever you live, that's when, you know, unless you're following, if you were following the rule, like if we were all following the rules and just, but most importantly, I have to say, you make me pick one thing, wear that dang mask. Cause that's the thing that you can control. That yeah. is, no one can take that away. People can get too close to you. People can do all kinds, the ventilation can be crappy somewhere. But you control the mask. And if you're wearing a mask, there are hardly any instances of people getting this that have been wearing masks. Well, uh, the other guest has arrived. I wanted to bring him on. Okay. We have uh, uh, Dr. Robert Schooley. He's the chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at UC San Diego Health uh, and one of the colleagues of, uh, of Dr. Prather as they've uh, gone around the, the, the globe virtually explaining the <laughs> virus and, and what we should know about it. Uh, I appreciate you coming hot off a, a conversation with some important people. Dr. Schooley, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I've talked to uh, uh, Dr. Prather about her efforts to help people understand aerosols and, and spread the word about how the virus spreads through the air. Uh, what's your version of, of, of the sort of basic thing you wish everybody understood uh, about the virus uh, and about what we can do to control it? Oh, hope I didn't lose him. Is he frozen? He has something on there. Can I telephone in and use a landline? Mm. I'm right. unable to hear the audio in an intelligible way. All right. Well, we'll work on that and bring okay. him back when we get okay. a shot. Okay. Um, uh, that's too bad. I, well, let's, uh, let's see. If He's we can... taught me a lot. I can almost act like a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, other, that other kind of doctor. He's taught me. <laughs> yeah. Did, he, did we get you back, Dr. Schooley? No. That's unfortunate. All again. right. Well, we'll work okay. on that. Um, okay. It's this world, man, this pandemic world. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let me ask you about this. So one of the things it was, it took days for this to come out and I'm really mad about it. Not mad, but I'm just frustrated as a communicator, as a communications professional, you know, somebody who really works hard with staff, with people to clarify their messages, to help them, you know, communicate what they're trying to get across. So there was a lot of people really confused about one part of the regulations that came out uh, with the new stay at home order that said, basically um, outdoor dining has to stop in these regions where the spread has really gotten high. Now um, I, I was on sports radio and they kept asking me to explain that because there was no data that anybody could find that showed this spread in outdoor dining. And I was like, well, I think it's 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 kind of an argument that like they're trying to control people's behavior. They're trying to keep people from going out for anything but to take care of their, you know, bodies, basically. And 
sure enough, uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, the leader of the of the Health and Human Services Department of the state of California said, "quote The decision to include, among other sectors, outdoor dining and limiting that, turning to restaurants to deliver and provide takeout options instead, really has to do with the goal of trying to keep people at home. It's not yeah. a comment on the relative safety." of outdoor dining. So he's basically saying like, we just needed people to understand that they shouldn't go out for anything else except for, you know, and it was really confusing because the governor's like, you should go out and you should, you should work out. You should, you mm -hmm. should hike, you should fish, mm -hmm. you should ski, although don't travel, you can't go to yeah. the ski resort. But, yeah. but, and so it was hard. It was contradictory for people. And it was difficult for them to handle logically, but uh, that made more sense to me. what he's saying is, is just, we just didn't want people to go out. Now, if in a perfect world, would you allow people to have outdoor dining um, mm -hmm. and and just trust them to not go indoors when they're done? Yeah, in a perfect world, but that's not what was they said. That's not what was happening, unfortunately. I mean, this is just a case where you know a few bad apples, <laughs> if you will, ruin it for everybody because they just kind of stretch it, and so then they're just like, okay, we just have to shut it down for everyone, everything, because it's the only way we can, the only way you can be sure that you'll stop it is just not letting kind of discouraging people from leave their house, leaving their houses. Yeah. What people don't, what one thing I want to say about this though, because it's crazy, like. Um, once the community spread is like it is right now, it's, you gotta, you kind of have to do more extreme measures. Um, you know, when it's low, um, when the community spread is low, you can get away with, um, you can sort of, you don't have to be this strict. Like think about, I think we've talked about before Asian countries, you know, think about Taiwan, right? Seven total deaths, 24 million people. And they just wore masks and they never shut down. So when people say masks are taking away my freedom, no, 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 they're giving you your freedom because you can go do things. You can, the economy, their economy never stopped. Yeah. So I do think that it's really important that people realize you gotta follow the rules or we have to go back to these really extreme measures where the only way you can be sure you stop it is to just tell everybody to stay home, which is unfortunate. Normally being outdoors, you know, the, the evidence is not there. I don't like the outdoor bubbles. But you know, there's these bubble, those little yeah, yeah. They're basically like indoors. indoors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Doctor, right, can, uh, can you hear us now? I, I can now. Can you hear me? Oh, great! Uh, yes, wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you're sick of listening to each chip. They're sick of uh, you. I got, got the you got the other doctor. No, uh, no, no. I strongly doubt it. Uh, I know it's been wonderful. So he tells better jokes than I do. Actually, <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> We were talking uh, with Dr. Prather about, um, you know, her core uh, effort to help people understand the virus in the air and how it spreads and how that might change guidance. Uh, I, I read, you know, I followed your uh, press uh, conference a, a few months ago about uh, wearing masks and how that can limit the spread or at least the, the severity of the infection that somebody might get. If there's one thing you wish people understood and incorporated into all their guidance about the virus these days, what would you, what would you say? It would really be masks. Uh, they help you both indoors and outdoors. And um, th I think the most destructive message that has gotten out through the public health community has been that this magic six feet uh, is something that protects you. Uh, when you're indoors, whether you're six feet away or two feet away or 10 feet away with someone that's not in your family, you should be wearing a mask. And these days, if you have someone in your family who is vulnerable and you're out working, uh, you want to try to protect them too. Uh, if my grandmother were still alive and I were um, out working, I'd want to try to wear a mask around her too at home because this virus is out there right now. And we need to get it down to a low level. Uh, I want to also pile on and agree with exactly what Dr. Prather was saying. We are in a situation right now where we have a lot of virus in the community. We've been trying to skim along just below the surface to keep things barely open. We need to get down to uh, the, a situation where a case is an unusual event. And then uh, we can start beginning to do the kinds of things we've all been wanting to do. But this business about saying we're almost to the threshold, we'll try to make it another week, that's just gotten us in trouble over and over again. It just makes it harder to fall back to where we want to be by waiting until the last minute. I want to show you both a chart that um, was presented to the county of San Diego yesterday by one of your colleagues uh, about uh, where we might be headed if, if things don't change. Uh, it was really alarming. Um, 
this was uh, um, uh, it basically made the case that if we don't change uh, where things are going, this uh, no action line is going to go past that. So we're at about uh, ICUs right now at about 200 and what was it, 21? Let's pull that up. Uh, we're at 228 uh, ICU patients right now. Uh, and then shows that it could go all the way up, you know, in this really high number. Now, it said that if we don't, if we if we keep this sort of stay at home order, we're going to be able to keep that down. I had a hard time understanding how just, you know, closing outdoor dining and barbershops would keep that down. I would assume what what we're saying with that is that if people also stop gathering because right. of you know uh, the this sort of collective urge to not go out, if that also influences people to really sort of lock things down again. Yeah, it's it's not just closing a barber shop or just closing a gym. It's really doing all of the things we've been talking about. Uh, I think we've all gotten too relaxed, and we just have to pull back uh, and bend that curve. The uh, Dr. Martin, uh, Dr. Nat Natasha Martin, has been the one who's doing the modeling, and she's unfortunately got the most pessimistic of all the models I've seen and un even more unfortunately has been right every time. And so uh, I, I really uh, think that uh, this is something we have to pay attention to. If you think about it, that's ab absolutely the wrong metric to be thinking about anyway. I mean, why would we want to wait until the last ICU bed is full before we do things to stop the epidemic around us? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I was just going to um, gaze at this. The, the spike is just uh it it's really alarming there are now 915 people in uh the hospital struggling with the virus um i asked dr prather of uh, this but i would like your thoughts too it's not um it, it, it's not clear to me what changed three weeks ago is she but what she pointed out is there was a there was kind of a surge of a virus that arrived and i think it might be analogous to your point about the severity of the disease being worse when there's a high concentration coming at you. And it's almost like that that was writ large for the entire community. There was a high concentration that came at us and then it made it spread more. Well, I think it's, it's that. And I think it's also the fact that what you see in terms of cases reflects what happened in terms of transmission several weeks ago. And what happened in terms of transmission several weeks ago uh, is driven by a virus coming in several weeks before that. So if you wait until you see a lot of cases, you've already waited uh, well beyond when you could have acted based on doing, watching the testing rates go up, for example. And if you wait until you start seeing the case rate goes up, then you've got so much momentum that the hospital rates are gonna go up for some time um, until um, you go back to the beginning and stop transmission. So you're right, it takes a long time for it to work through the system. All of us staying home, each of us in a single room, seeing no other human for the next two weeks would have a major impact, but it would take two weeks to do it because we have two weeks worth of infection already in the community waiting to become clinically apparent because of the incubation period. So um, there's a tendency to wait until you see disease before you act when we should be acting when we see uh, viral transmission. We did the same thing in the AIDS era. Uh, we waited until there were a lot of cases in the country for the country's politicians say, oh, yes, we have an AIDS problem. But in fact, the virus had been there for a year or so. And we saw the same, we've seen the same thing here. Uh, this virus was circulating in the U.S. long before we saw it in that one nursing home in, in Washington. And just yeah. stopping airplanes from China wouldn't have done a, a thing. It would have stopped new cases from getting in, but we had to address the cases that are already here. And as you were saying, we already have cases here in San Diego that we have to address. Um, with the kinds of, of measures we're talking about. One of the things, um, you know, this audience uh, uh, for Voice San Diego at Home is very focused on, on schools. We've talked weekly about schools, uh, about the impact on kids and the struggle a lot of parents and, and families and teachers are having right now. And um, so let's get into some questions uh, about that. Um, I think uh, let's pull up uh, this one here, Dr. Prather. Would you recommend opening a school without appropriate uh, filtration for viruses? Do you think it's important to notify teachers if there's a student in their classroom uh, with COVID? Um, I think uh, at the heart of, of that point is, is, I mean, I think you're going to say like, no, they should have appropriate <laughs> ventilation. But um, 
Yeah. I, I, ventilation I, first, right? She was yeah, asked about filtration. If you can I ventilate. Think- if you were to send a memo to every school district and who was that was considering opening, the memo would say, you know, put away the plexiglass and and the and the and the and the wipes, and focus on getting outside, ventilation and masks. Fair. Fair. I mean, keep a distance. I would still keep surfaces because there's kids coughing. <laughs> Probably. I would still wipe down surfaces, but right now it's like they're wiping. That's what they do. You know, that's the main way. So definitely clean the air before clean the, before surfaces. I don't know, Chip, what do you think on that? I mean, wear masks is the biggest one. No, I agree totally. I mean, I think we, uh, we know that, that masks work. Um, you can find viral RNA on surfaces, but most of it is not infectious and some of it could have been there for weeks and that's not how p- people are getting infected. So yeah, it's great to wipe down desks, but you shouldn't do that and think that if you do that, you don't have to worry about uh, the way it's really being transmitted, which is in the air. Last week, um, uh, Dr. Prather, I, I talked about um, schools, and I, I think I hinted, and I probably uh, didn't mean it this harshly, but I hinted <laughs> that maybe you had, um, that, that your time had been wasted with with working with some of these schools because they're just going to, it fears, wait until the, the vaccine is is in place and and it, you know won't have to do any of this mitigation. Uh, you had some, uh, I think, some good perspective, and I don't, I didn't mean it that harsh, but I can see how it came yeah. that way. So maybe put into perspective the way you're looking at that sort of quandary. I mean, yeah, seems like they might be waiting until the vaccine at this point, but um, I don't. I think they're waiting for the community. I mean, Chip can comment on that part better than I can. I'll just say, I think they're waiting for the community. Right now, the numbers are where they're going. You don't open a school anywhere. Um, but what I, you know, I appreciate you looking out for my time. But I actually, I mean, there's a bunch of us, there's a network of us that are helping schools worldwide. And what I see, they did this school, San Diego Unified. I taught, you know, I told them what to clean, what to buy, what to use. They did everything that I said. And they're serious. They're contacting me, sending me data. You know, what are the, why is this particle count? Why is this number? You know, so they really put a huge amount into getting ready to open. They want to open, right? And so I didn't feel like my time was wasted because they literally did everything I said. I think they even went beyond what I said. And I, this did not, has not happened in other school districts. I have so many friends, so many teachers that are so upset with what they're being sent back into right? And not being given a choice, which is really scary. That won't happen here. And so to me, it's like, I think that, you know, until the numbers, like Chip says, we got to dig them down, you know, we got to bring them way down, then the schools are ready to open. I don't, I don't know. I, I can't read minds, but I think if we can do that soon, I don't think we'll wait for the vaccines. I don't know. Chip, you want to comment on that? You know better than I do on that part. Yeah. I mean, the vaccine, um, story is a great one. I mean, the the vaccines look to be very safe. They look to be very effective. Um, FDA is doing a very careful job looking at them. There's going to be a hearing tomorrow, which a lot of the um, data will be shown publicly. And so I think we all feel very good about the vaccine uh, issue, but the vaccines have to be produced and they have to be gotten into people's arms. And uh, that's going to take some time. Uh, We probably won't get to K through 12 um, in terms of the supply uh, availability until summer. So we're really talking about whether we want to have the schools open in the uh, in the fall and the um, in the winter and spring. I can also say that um, the things that Dr. Prather has been talking about, ventilation and so forth, are also things that keep influenza down. They keep other uh, viruses and infections down. So are all things that have other benefits that will persist long after COVID is gone. We've seen decreased rates of uh, influenza. Uh, we've seen decreased rates of meningococcal disease uh, in uh, closed populations, all because uh, respiratory syncytial virus, metanumal virus, uh, because of more um, consistency about realizing how these agents spread among us. And uh, so none of this is wasted. Uh, not everybody listens to everything you say and uh, not everything we say uh, is going to be right all the time, but we try to make it right by watching what happens and learning from it and being open and honest about it and giving the best advice we have and realizing that in different contexts, you'll have to use different types of, of, um, of, of empathy. Some places have buildings in which the windows won't open. There you have to go into other approaches, keeping the air clean. Uh, so uh, every everything is a puzzle, but 
uh, the pieces are, are, are important. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, I mean, I think this is going to be huge for health in that kids spend how much time breathing and they've been breathing yucky indoor air for, for lack of a better term. And kids that live in um, less affluent areas are known to be right next to a factory that's emitting or right next to a roadway that's emitting. These kids are, their lungs are developing, right? And they're, that's all going to be taken care of in this. And so cognitive issues, asthma, all that you know, for developing, you know, kids with, you know, their lungs developing should get much better in the future. That's yeah. a really good point. So, so yeah. So focusing on cleaning air and ventilating well would have benefits beyond just controlling COVID. So that's a great point. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take some of these questions uh, of, uh, have responded well and, and brought a lot of questions here. So uh, I'm going to bring this one up. This is a little uh, personal because uh, my wife uh, wanted me to ask this as well. She has a theory that part of the reason that, that uh, older kids 15 and above spread the disease more is because they are, uh, they're always smooching and, and hanging out together in cars and, and socializing a lot. Uh, please address the secondary schools with 30 to 40 uh, students per class. They get in the car at lunch. Uh, is it is it a fundamentally uh, different calculation uh, for these older uh, kids? And and you know, it, it, is there a reason to maybe hold them out for a while longer? Chip, you want to take that? Well, you know the the um, uh, the virus is is uh, looking for places to go twenty four hours a day, and so uh, just as we can't expect our teachers to do 100% of the education of our kids. We can't expect the virus to uh, not be transmitted if we do everything right in school and don't do everything right after school. And so you're, you're right. Uh, teenagers are more social and uh, they get around. It's important for them to, however, um, continue to wear the mask and do things that they do in school when they're out of school uh, to, uh, to prevent transmission there. It's important to think about cohorting and uh, reducing the likelihood of large spreading events um, as best we can. Uh, we can't stop all spread no matter what we do, but we can, we take the lid off of it and gradually uh, work it down. It'll be safer for them to do things together out of school as well. Uh, I'm not a, a, a K through 12 educator, but my understanding is it's a lot harder for the younger kids to do some of the um, online learning. I have two granddaughters and the my 10th grader is finding it a lot easier than the seventh grader in terms of kind of following things. And I think if you extrapolate down to third and fourth grade, it's important to get them to school and to socialize, uh, to be in places where they are working with peers and learning and uh, eyes on the teacher. So I can see both educational and, um, and transmission related um, reasons to, to focus on the younger uh, students first. Let's take another one. Um, uh, Let's see. So uh, Arpita talks about how safe is an outdoor mask activity like dance or gymnastics class. So one thing that happened in the latest stay at home order, the governor uh, did encourage people to do outdoor fitness classes, to go outside, to walk their dogs, to, um, you know, uh, so outdoor gyms are still allowed. Uh, he basically made the determination that uh, you should not go out of your house except to take care of your body. Uh, and so I think interpreting that I, their guidance is that outdoor activities uh, are um, uh, pretty safe, especially if you're just trying to take care of your physical fitness and, and your health and your dog, uh, your dog's needs as well. So uh, is that what you would say as well as uh, kids that are uh, gathered in say an outdoor um, um, class, uh, are are they okay? Yeah, I mean, outdoors is a million times better than indoors. It just, the air just dilutes. And, but still the most important thing for outdoors is just distance. You still need distance. And so contact, people ask me about contact sports, you know, some of that, you know, people are still getting too close, but just outdoors where you can space people apart. Um, and if you can't, then, you know, right now with the spread so high, if you want as low risk as possible, you'd still wear a mask. Um, although people laugh at me when I wear a mask outdoors. But again, I'm just trying to make I'm trying to be as sure as I possibly can. So that's my take is outdoors is much, much safer, but you still have to do distancing. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Scooby, let me ask you, there was a woman uh, brought up on in the comments, a question about whether the, the virus can be um, 
take it in through your eyes. We've been talking so much about air, about breathing, about ventilation. And this seems analogous to the surface concern, right? It's it's a um, probably pretty rare from what we know. It's extremely rare. I mean, some people have argued that uh, you should wear um, eye coverings as well. We do that in hospitals uh, where people are being intubated and there's a lot of virus right in your face. But in the general public, it's hard to show an incremental benefit of an eye cover, for example, over wearing the mask itself, just because so much of it is driven by what we breathe. Uh, and um, uh, it's rare to be able to isolate virus from tears. So uh, unless you're doing something in a situation like um, uh, an optometrist right up in front of somebody's face or uh, an anesthesiologist, I would focus more on the nose and mouth. One thing I would definitely do is not think that putting a plastic shield in front of your face to protect your eyes, nose, uh, and mouth does anything if you don't have a mask on as well, because I've seen some people walking around with shields on. Yeah. With no mask. I saw one with a shield that went up like this, and I, it just looked like a funnel for the virus to come right in. It didn't look like uh, an actual protection. Am I right to that's exactly, conclude that? That's, ex that's exactly what it does. It just concentrates it. That's what the plexiglass barriers do too. They just air just goes right up over the top, comes down, drops, and just sits right, right, gets stuck right there where you're breathing. And same thing with with shields. Like yeah. so, there, so there is a, a a place for plexiglass and shields if if there's actual, like you said, like spray coming and you need to stop it, like a sneeze guard kind of situation. But when you're putting plexiglass up to divide up rooms and stuff, you're creating, you're blocking that flow that's so important. Yep. Well, that's exactly right. It's uh, back to like it makes you feel good, kind of, but it doesn't work. Aerosols just don't care. They just go, yeah, it makes it worse, actually. Yeah. Um, let's get some other uh, questions. Um, thank you both for, for taking this time uh, to talk with us. Um, I guess, let's see if I can. Just switch uh, in general. So I, when we look at the um, uh, the, the spread interpersonally in, in, in homes, uh, Dr. Schooley, let's say somebody does uh, get the, the virus, comes home, uh, they test positive. You want to take care of that person. Um, are there things uh, should should you should you try to get out? How do you how do you manage that sort of thing? Um, and I, I guess you would point to ventilation. Is there anything else to keep in mind? Yeah, there's going to be a lot of people dealing with family members who are sick who don't go to the hospital in the next few weeks. Yeah, there, that's true. And uh, there is quite a bit of secondary spread in households. Uh, and uh, the percentages that um, occur, uh, our, our understanding of that has improved over the course of the epidemic. When it first hit China, the party line was only 3% of people in households get infected. We now that depending, know that depending on the household, it can be as high as 60 or 70%. And so uh, it's um, uh, there are ways, obviously, if you have a house and you can have the person not share a bathroom and be away from other people and where everybody wears masks, you're going to have that be lower than it would have been if you're not doing that, but it won't be zero. If you have someone in the house who's particularly at risk, um, emphysema, somebody who's older, somebody who's obese, you might want to get them out of the house uh, until the period of infectivity is over or to have the infected person out of the house just because uh, they're going to be the people who end up in the ICU beds that we're running out of. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, the other thing I, I've run into this with, um, you know, somebody who has to go out to work all the time, they're potentially bringing it back and you do have susceptible, you know, susceptible people. What I've told people is make sure they have their own bedroom, own bathroom, but also put a HEPA filter in their room, you know, filter the virus. Those are aerosols. They're very filter, filterate. You can filter them out. Um, and so just, and, and masks or everything, but you can add filtration to your house too. And that makes a big difference. And, and, and if they're in their own room, just have their window open so that their air is just going out. Uh, I'm going to follow that up real quick, but let's take a question that just came in. Isn't distancing, you you talked about this earlier, but let's focus on this. Isn't distancing still important inside school classrooms? So many schools are pushing for one meter instead of six feet. I think you would have an interesting take on this, Dr. Prather, that uh, the distancing 
isn't as, as significant in any way as uh, the, the ventilation. Is that fair? You know, they're both important. Ventilation reduces the concentration, so does distance. So the highest concentration is right where the person's mouth is that's sick. And the further you go away from that, it just falls off. It's just like one of the, it's equivalent to when you go outside. So, but if you can ventilate, you know, but the problem is, is like if you're, you know, two feet away from somebody, ventilation isn't going to protect you in that case if that person's sick. So you always want to keep, that's crazy. I don't know how else to say it. Three feet in a classroom, it, it's not good. And, you know, you need, it falls off so fast, especially, you know, if it is the bigger drops or whatever. So distance is still really, really important. But kids can't judge distances very well. And so you want to also just make sure they have their masks. But then again, they don't always wear their masks right. There's leaks, right? And so that's why they we talk about the Swiss cheese model, right? There's layers, multiple layers. You stack them, each one has a little leak, a little hole, but by the time you stack it all together, you're protected. And so the more measures you can put in and follow, the lower the risk by far. The and the plexiglass does not make up for distance. Like you, you put a, two kids right next to each mm -hmm. other, and that makes it almost more dangerous in a weird. Well, if they cough, if kids are coughing and sneezing, then the plexiglass will help stop yeah. people spraying on each other. Um, <laughs> but that's about it. I, I, if they do manage to get schools open, one thing kids do at schools is cough and sneeze a lot. <laughs> like even mm -hmm. without the disease, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, I can't imagine how to handle that. Uh, all right, um, our friend uh, Helen uh, is on with a question. What about a portable CO2 monitor? Should you carry one around or should you have one like that? Uh, uh, that's that's what you got there, that battery powered? <laughs> yeah, it is. And we just built, we worked with uh, La Jolla Country Day and they built, they came up with a design and we could build them for like about $70 each. Oh. So this one was about a hundred um, and I do take it with me. But um, yeah, so you can, you, you know, these are going to, these are very popular right now. So they're hard to get hold of actually. So we're making, we're making our own. Let's do um, another question. This came up uh, twice on here. Uh, how high is the risk of a neighbors having a party in their backyard? Um, it seems like uh, outdoor party, not near you, is pretty minor, but I'm not sure what you would say about that. Uh, Dr. Scooby? No, it's uh, much less risky than going to their party. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but, you know, I, I think distance is important. Uh, obviously, um, you could be in a situation where you have 100 people at a rave next door, and that would be a bad idea. But if you see your neighbor having a backyard barbecue with four or five people, you don't need to go inside and lock yourself in like a hermit. You just need to uh, get ready to get them some flowers when they go to the hospital. Let's take, uh, uh, there's been a few people asking about the specific model of, of CO2 uh, uh, meters there. Uh, Dr. Prather, can you? Yeah, this one is, a air, this is what's called an Aranet, A-R-A-N-E-T-4. It's the one that most of us use because it's just, a, oh, my dog's barking. Yeah. It's just, a, it's just, it's, it's actually pretty accurate. Um, you just have to calibrate it every once in a while by throwing it outside. It's super user friendly. Um, but there's a bunch now. You can get them on Amazon. You can look them up. There's a, a CO2meters.com or something like that that just has all different ones. To say what we're doing, what I encourage, I like the idea of the schools building their own because those kids get to learn hands on and get to make measurements. Kids are recording the measurements in their rooms. They built it into the curriculum. Where does the CO2 come from? How do we get CO2? You know, so it's kind of a neat teaching tool. Too. Yeah. And, and as you pointed out, the outdoors, it's 420. That number is actually pretty, pretty significant historically, yep. right? That's the highest in yep. recorded history. Yep. And part of the reason we're dealing with global climate change. So um, it, you can yep. learn all kinds of things about our world. Through respiration. Like respiration. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, let's, uh, I got to let you guys go and, and probably get some dinner and such. Um, but Let's zoom back. If we had had a better understanding of this virus at the beginning, we might have uh, launched right away. Instead of people going crazy for wipes and stuff, they would have really focused on CO2 monitors in classrooms. Uh, you know, they would have focused on ventilation. They would have focused on masks. Uh, how do we 
sort of learn from that experience. Uh, should should aerosols just be a more important part of our discussion about diseases in general? Or was this just the difficulty of our first, you know, major pandemic in our lifetime? Well, I'll tell you, there's pictures. You can go online, look at the pandemic in 1918. They were teaching classes. They have chalkboards outside. They have people getting their hair cut outside in barber chairs. They figured out the ventilation. They have kids all bundled up indoors with all the windows open. It, it's It's been there. It, it, this is, we're just repeating history, actually a better medical now than then, but we've just ignored it. They stopped wearing masks. I got tired of it. They got fatigued. You know, we're sort of repeating history. What I will say is I think going forward, people are going to be much more, um, I hope, much more aware. The weird one about this, what I will say, why this one has been a little sneakier, is because when you have a cold or a flu, you kind of get your symptoms faster when you're infectious. It's kind of more well-timed. We think, maybe not. Maybe we'll go back and find out that you're spreading it for a while too. But in this one, since there's so many people who never get symptoms that are spreading it, you know, they say that like 20% of the, you know, infections lead to 80%. So it's like some small number, you know, if you're unlucky and with that person, you get it. So there's something different, it seems like, but also just, you know, the, this is not new. The aerosols have always been there. So I think we'll have to look back and people are already looking back at just this common flu. I think masks will help. That's what they've been doing in Asia for a long time. I don't know, Chip. No, I think that uh, the other thing that's been important about this outbreak is it's gotten the aerosol science community uh, talking to the medical community and the public health community. They've been two different camps thinking about diseases in different ways. And um, the public health community tried to bundle this as if it were just a different flu. And it's a very different mode of spread uh, with very different pathogenesis. And they didn't think about the fact that this virus is being produced deep in the lungs and coming out with uh, breathing as opposed to influenza that's growing in your nose and comes out when you sneeze. And they tried to use the same public health principles. Oh, so well, what I have here is drive it by science and get the scientists that you need to understand the problem at the table and come up with scientifically based solutions and then make sure your politicians understand that uh, paying attention to the scientific principles will get them out of the hole a lot faster than kind of making up stuff as they go. But a question from Seth on Twitter. He said, um, do scientists feel that current science is being reflected in the state in the uh, health order? So I, let's say one to 10, 10 is, yeah, they're right on. They've got the, the exact guidance we would put out for this thing. Uh, you know, one is like, they're just, they're just telling people to, I don't know. I'm not going to try to make that up. But uh, uh, how would you rate it, uh, Dr. Prather? They, they seem to have uh, really embraced the outdoors, the ventilation in some ways, but maybe not all. Well, I mean, you mean the latest health orders are staying, yeah. trying to stay at home. That's just because we're backed into a corner. Right. Um, I, where I would like to see people do better in, in the state of California and the county of San Diego in terms of paying attention to the science is the order of reopening. That they're not they're just randomly, they're just trying to force the businesses open, right? And I understand we need the economy going again, but if you do it in the wrong order, we just keep doing the start and stop. If we had just knocked this virus dead back in March, we would have gone down into the, you know, we'd be like Australia. We would be living our lives right now, but we keep not quite getting there and then opening the wrong thing, the riskiest things, and then, yeah, you make money for two weeks, but then you shut everything down until you can recover. And now we're really backed into a corner because the numbers are skyrocketing. So my answer is two, twofold. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I just hope that when we get ready to reopen, once we knock it right now, we have we're sort of back. We have to do the shutdown. I mean, that's kind of where we are. We don't have a choice. And, you know, that, you know, so I, it's two different answers, but I want to see us get out of this and stay out of it is what I hope. And I think they could follow the science better here than they have. Chip. I think we know what works and uh, we know that uh, if we do this, we'll see the curve bend. Uh, I think the good news now though, is we see that over the next six months, this vaccine that is coming is going to have a massive impact on what we're going to be able to do. But in the meantime, we have to be able to uh, to live to get to that vaccine, and not just us, our grandparents and our uh, other colleagues who have underlying health conditions, and we need to be responsible in that interval. We also need to, to support those businesses during this period of time so that they're around 
uh, at a time when we can reopen and do what we want to do uh, and and get back to our, our society. We're not in a situation now where we think this is going to be open-ended forever. And this reticence to spend money now to be able to have the uh, functional businesses there to really snap back and get our economy going. Uh, now that we have a pretty good idea of what the end game is going to be, we should invest now in a recovery uh, effort to not have those businesses go under, not have the people lose their houses who have been working uh, and have to stay home and not have such a strong incentive to get back to work just to hold on to your house. You should be able to hold on to your house with help from the rest of us mm -hmm. until you can get back uh, to work because we have a vaccine and because the, the, the virus is under control. And then we can all say, boy, that was a tough year or so. Uh, let's get this country moving again. Let's stop having the SDU spilled. We've got a lot of things to do. Yeah, I did. I mean, I did notice in New York, I was listening to sort of how they're handling it. When their governor tells them we're going to close down the businesses, they also are giving them incentive. They're giving them, they're helping them financially. And that's mm -hmm. hugely important, you know? And so we need to think about that. And as citizens, I mean, we just, buy food out and get big tips as best we can when we can and buy gift cards. And we're trying to keep things going because it is a really rough road for people right now. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I thank you both, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Schooley uh, and uh, Dr. Kimothy, Kimberly Perry there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm having trouble speaking. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, check out. And if you are a science teacher and you do build one of those CO2 meters, uh, with your class or or adapt anything. We'd love to see it. Uh, uh, you can always find me at voiceofsandiego.org. Uh, thank you guys and uh, uh, hang in there. We'll all uh, we'll all get through it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Okay, thank you. Bye, Jim. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining Voice of San Diego at Home, this special edition. Uh, send all your questions, any uh, anything you wish we would have followed up on, any other ideas or, or stories you wish we would do. I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, just one small thing. If you value this kind of work, this kind of story uh, telling or just discussion, uh, please go to voiceofsandiego.org and donate. We are in our last few weeks of trying to raise uh, money so we can pay all the reporters we have uh, and all the expenses and the masks so that they can work and, and the keyboards and such. Uh, so please, we uh, voiceofsandiego.org slash donate. Uh, you can also just go to voiceofsandiego.org. You'll see uh, some invitations to do that. Uh, thank you all for your support. You can also sign up for all the newsletters there uh, and have a great week. Uh, stay at home except to take care of your body uh, and recreate and uh, we'll get through this. I, I actually wish that there was like a fund you could invest in that was like, because it's going to be such a good boom when we're out of this. If you could just invest in a fund that kept some of these restaurants and stuff going so you got a little, you, you, they could survive and get out of that. This can be, they're going to be able to pay it back. It can be a boom. Let's invest. Let's keep people going. Let's get through this together. Uh, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I know it's rough. Uh, uh, take care, guys. And we'll talk to you uh, soon. Friday, Friday 5, live at 5.